Hello everyone, today I will talk about Bitcoin mining and how it's becoming more institutional and more global. So we'll cover a variety of topics in this presentation, such as the last 10 years of mining, uh, what mining looked like in the past, some of the recent trends that we're seeing, the commoditization of mining hardware or ASICs, Blockstream's advancements, along with some of the future trends that may happen. So a brief introduction to myself. My name is Samson Mo. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at Blockstream, and I was the former COO at BTCC, or BTC China. So back in the day, we were one of the largest exchanges and mining pools in the world. So a lot of my mining experience started from running the BTCC pool, uh, along with some mining farms in China. I was also the former director of production at Ubisoft, and I am a Bitcoin enthusiast and crypto hat designer. So I'll introduce some Blockstream products briefly. We have the Liquid Network, which is an inter-exchange settlement network linking together cryptocurrency exchanges around the world. So you can move Liquid Bitcoin and other assets issued in the Liquid Network quickly and fluidly between different uh, venues to trade. We have uh, Tether, which is one of the largest stable coins out there. Uh, we have Liquid CAD from Bull Bitcoin, along with several other um, stable coins that are currently being rolled out. We also have Blockstream Green, which is a non-custodial multi-sig Bitcoin wallet. We have Blockstream Mining, of course, which is going to be talked about during this presentation. Um, we also have Blockstream Satellite, which is a satellite service that is streaming Bitcoin blocks through geosynchronous satellites around the Earth. And what this allows you to do is download the entire Bitcoin blockchain for free. And we recently released an update where you can actually synchronize the Bitcoin blockchain purely from the satellite service from the Genesis block. So every single Bitcoin block since the birth of Bitcoin. We have the cryptocurrency data feed, which is a partnership with ICE data services. And we're collecting all trading data and price information from cryptocurrency exchanges and selling it in this consolidated feed. Uh, we also have Elements, which is a platform to create your own blockchain. That's also what Liquid is built on top of. And Elements is a fork of the Bitcoin code, code base where we do most of our R&D. Uh, at Blockstream, we do a lot of open source contributions. So we contribute to Bitcoin, the Lightning Network, as well as a new smart contracting language called Simplicity. So let's talk about what happened in the last 10 years of mining. It's been a very exciting ride for sure. So we had the release of the Bitcoin client in 2009, and this was when we were still in the age of CPU mining with Satoshi Nakamoto mining, Halfini mining, and it was very early days. We moved into GPU mining, which was from Art4s and others. They developed software to use uh, graphics cards to mine Bitcoin. Then in 2012, we saw the first ASICs announced, and the first one was from Avalon, and had a 60 giga hash of hash rate and it was dominating the GPU miners, which in turn had dominated CPU miners. Uh, but that led to a dramatic rise in Bitcoin's hash rate in 2013 to 2015. And that was primarily due to a lot of ASICs coming online at that time. In uh, 2018, we saw Bitcoin's hash rate nearly triple in the period of a year. And actually Blockstream got into mining shortly after I joined in 2017. That was when we had started the uh, mining initiative in North America. Um, in 2019, we announced Blockstream Mining, and this was kind of the real shift, I think, from mining from China into North America. And after this announcement, we saw a lot more players announce that they were coming into nor to North America. And we brought on institutional customers as well, such as Fidelity and Reed Hoffman. In 2019 to 2020, this is a uh, you know, recent years we saw the implosion of Bitmain, um, their failed IPO, um, their internal struggles in the company where the two co-CEOs are trying to fight for power. Uh, we've seen IPOs in the US, so Canaan IPO'd, eBang has filed for an IPO, and we're seeing the, the rise of MicroBT, which is now the manufacturer of the most efficient mining hardware on the market. So if we look at Bitcoin's hash rate, um, it's, it's grown a lot in the last couple of years. 
uh, we've gone from 1.56 exahash at the last halving to 127 exahash now. So if you look at this chart, it's almost like we had barely any hash rate at the time of the last halving. And now we have a massive amount of hash rate. And I think miners are generally very bullish on Bitcoin. So mining in the past, what did it look like? Well, first we started out with early hobbyist miners, such as GPU mining rigs with AMD graphics cards. So it looked kind of like this. It was not that advanced, but it did the job. Then we moved on to more specialized mining hardware. So we had FPGA miners, and this is the Icarus one. Um, it's still, I think it's a major advancement, but it was still very early. And this is kind of what an Icarus FPGA farm looked like. It was a, a mess of cables and, and cards all tied up together. Then we moved into ASIC miners. So this was the first ASIC miner, the Avalon 1. And these mined at about 60 gigahashes a second. And this was massive at the time. It was a huge advancement. So then you have early professional mining setups. These are ASIC miner blades, and they allowed for far more hash rate per square foot than the previous generations of mining equipment. However, you still have uh, problems with early professional mining. So you had uh, catastrophic fires in 2014, and I believe this is a Spondylese facility, uh, but it probably has to do with how it was wired up. Even in 2016, this is just a, a general mining farm. You can see that safety is not a priority. You have cables all over the place and it's largely open air. Um, and if you look at some of the facilities in China, they're typically like this. They're very dusty and uh, they have large fans blowing from one side through the aisle onto the other aisle. So what are some of the recent trends? The mining market's about 11 billion right now, and we're seeing growth rates of 260% uh, each year. Um, that's rapid growth, and it should lead to about a $500 billion market in five years' time. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of migration of hash rate to North America, and there are good reasons for that because uh, people are worried that China will clamp down on mining, so people want to move out and be in a geopolitically stable region. We're also seeing a trend of having more institutional customers come on board for mining. So as mentioned, we have Fidelity now that is mining with Blockstream and Reid Hoffman. He's the co-founder of LinkedIn. And recently we saw some news where the Ukrainian government was saying that they want to mine as well using excess nuclear power. So these are definitely interesting times. We're seeing a level up of operations. Um, with institutional customers comes enterprise demand for hosting and they can be very demanding. You have a lot of automation required for upgrading and managing miners. Uh, you have extensive stress testing, so they really want to know everything works and spend a lot of time doing due diligence. You have very high physical network security requirements that need to be met for these global finance, financial institutions. They want to know that their investments, their multi-million dollar investments are safe and secure and won't be stolen. That has been a problem the mining industry has had in the past where uh, miners are just stolen from farms. And it's difficult to deal with that uh, after the fact. And you also have an array of other compliance requirements that need to be met as well. So with increased demand and requirements for higher levels of service comes a lot more work for the mining farm operators. We're also seeing a lot of energy diversification we're seeing a shift to new sources of energy or even new models of mining. So uh, if you're talking about energy sources like the Ukraine trying to use nuclear power, well, Blockstream is ahead of that. Nuclear energy is part of our mix in Georgia. Uh, you have upstream data, which is focused on natural gas waste energy. So they're just deploying small containers nearby natural gas uh, flares where they're just burning it off and using that excess power to mine. Uh, you have Layer 1, which is backed by Peter Thiel. Their focus seems to be on wind and solar, in addition to more traditional uh, renewables like hydropower. And you have Mint Green out of Vancouver. They're focused on heat recovery. So they're trying to do an innovative system where they're recovering heat from the miners to heat um, various uh, institutions or installations. 
you also have more geographic diversification now. So as we talked about miners leaving China, um, that is definitely something that has been happening. And uh, over the past few years, we've been seeing a lot more of it. So miners do want stability. Um, you can find cheap power in a lot of different places, but that comes with a caveat. So typically you could have a ban or you could have a political upheaval, and then that really impacts your operations. Um, you also have mi Chinese miners moving abroad too, mi moving their operations or expanding their operations. So the concept of a Chinese miner in China is getting very outdated because Chinese miners can now be in North America. Um, for North America, I think we're seeing it becoming a new frontier for mining. So you have Blockstream leading the pack with 300 megawatts. Uh, Layer 1 has claimed that they would be at 200 megawatts now. And then you have Windstone and Northern Bitcoin also with a large chunk of power. Uh, but there's always a search for cheaper energy as people try to diversify. And there are usually cheaper electrical costs in the US and Canada, but that is often counterbalanced by higher setup costs and longer build times. So you can build a mining farm in China and pay uh, maybe six, seven cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but you can get up and running much faster and your operational costs are lower, cost of labor is lower, uh, whereas in North America you can get two to three cents, but that comes with uh, a lot more costs in terms of your build quality, certifications, and just generally longer build times to get everything up and running. Another trend is commoditization of hardware. So we've seen a lot of growth in hash rate. And a lot of that is coming from the ASIC manufacturers becoming more and more efficient. But at the same time, we're also becoming more commoditized. So your typical next gen miner from one of these manufacturers is getting to be about the same. Whereas in the past, Bitmain was typically leading the pack. And they started that uh, with the S9 in 2016. But today, what we're seeing is uh, MicroBT is leading the pack. And their chip designer is actually the guy that designed the S9, uh, Yang Zhuoxing. But they are the most efficient miner on the market right now at 38 joules per terahash, which is much better than anything else available. Um, but typically what you want is to get the most efficient miner uh, because power consumption is a large chunk of your operational cost. We're also entering the 3X era now. So if the ant miner S9 propelled us to sub 100 joules per terahash levels, then the micro BT series, the M30S and plus plus uh, miners is getting us down to 30 something uh, joules per terahash, which is probably new frontier for us. And it's interesting with the timing because it's coming just before the halving, just like the ant miner S9 came before the 2016 halving. So history kind of repeats itself. So what are we doing at Blockstream? We've got a lot of things going on in addition to mining, but we've been making a lot of headway on mining as well. Our two main value propositions are modular mining and rapid deploy power distribution. Uh, we have about 300 megawatts of capacity across our two facilities, and we are rapidly expanding. Hopefully we'll get even more power online by next year. So some of the interesting breakthroughs we've had at Blockstream Mining include specialized modular containerization systems developed through machine learning and simulation. So the interesting thing here is a lot of our simulations actually played out uh, almost perfectly when we constructed these uh, container systems in the real world. So it validates our methodology for developing them. And I would say our containerization systems are some of the most advanced on the market right now. We have MERV 13 rated air filtration. This is equivalent to a tier four data center. So top tier enterprise grade data center. And what that means is our hardware will typically last longer because we're filtering and cleaning the air as it comes through. Whereas a lot of mining facilities are just blasting the air along with the dust into the miners as they try to cool them. Um, we have sophisticated airflow management systems, which means that we can operate in any environment in the world, whether it's hot, humid, hot, dry, cold, humid, or cold, dry, it doesn't matter. Our container systems can handle anything. Leveraging Blockstream satellite, we can actually mine anywhere in the world. So this is a, an 
interesting side effect of uh, the Blockstream Satellite project, which is we can get the blockchain. So all you need to do is uh, broadcast the block found, and that can be done through lower bandwidth methods or even through uh, cellular, cellular data connections. Uh, we've also pioneered per port power metering. So our customers can see at a very granular, le granular level what uh, each miner that they're hosting with us is consuming. And we have our own uh, software system that allows our customers to manage and power cycle their miners. So what does the future hold? I think we'll see improved efficiency through standardization. So right now, every manufacturer has a different form factor. And I think we'll gravitate towards probably the one U server form factor. I think it makes the most sense and standard component sizes. So you can keep the one U chassis and just replace the guts from different ASIC manufacturers. Um, and it should just be replacing hash boards largely instead of buying a whole new miner. And that will serve to reduce a lot of the waste and it'll be faster for repairs too. So you can just ship the hash board out versus shipping uh, more stuff when things break down because you can just replace other components assuming they're standardized. We'll also see a lot more growth in enterprise grade mining offerings. So for us at Blockstream, we see a lot of demand for hosting services and it uh, just shows that there's a lot of appetite out there to start mining. And institutions typically want ease of deployment. They want a turnkey solution where uh, we can help them acquire the miners, we can help them get racked up and they have control over their own hardware. And we think this will be the trend. It's going to be co-location rather than cloud mining because cloud mining has uh, uh, very shady connotations because there have been a lot, lot of cloud mining scams in the past. And with co-location, you actually own your own hardware. Um, so you have depreciation, which works to your benefit. And with uh, granular levels of reporting, you can actually see exactly what you are mining with your hardware. So another trend that we see coming will be that more people get involved in mining because they realize it can be more profitable to mine rather than just buying Bitcoin outright. I don't think a lot of people have come to this realization yet because you need to understand how mining works, difficulty adjustments work, and be decent at modeling. But we call this Difficulty Adjusted Bitcoin Acquisition, or DABA for short. Now the premise here is really simple. You mine more Bitcoin because when the price drops, hash rate drops, and then difficulty drops, and you get more Bitcoin. So you have downside protection and upside participation. Now the caveat is really that you're not over leveraged or inefficient, but barring that, you should be mining more Bitcoin whenever the price drops. So in the example I'm giving here, if you had bought $100,000 worth of Bitcoin in 2017 when the price was $15,000, you'd have 6.7 BTC. But Bitcoin's price dropped as low as 3400 and later recovered to 7500 So during that time, you would have experienced DABA. And you would have mined 16.7 BTC. And this is an actual example of what we've experienced at Blockstream. So you're basically getting 2.5 times more Bitcoin than you would have normally by mining versus purchasing outright. In US dollar terms, you'd, you'd have had a 25% profit in mining versus a 50% loss from buying. So we think that as people come to realize mining is actually great for acquiring Bitcoin, more people will get involved in mining and the industry will grow. So those are our trends that uh, we're predicting. And I hope you found my presentation interesting. And I'll be happy to answer more questions later. Thank you.